starting timer. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. For this way, I'm standing of the session is 5 to 6. You have to end it by 6. Whenever you want to start, you can start. You need to end it by 6. <laughs> okay. Is it 5 already? Yeah, what it is. is. It is. Okay. It is? Okay. Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome once again to the Pearl Academy Silver Oak Lawns. This venue is brought to you by Pearl Academy. This is the second day of the Times Lit Fest 2017 and this is the third edition of Delhi's favorite festival of ideas. Presenting partner Rajni Ganda, clean energy partner Gail, knowledge partner Pearl Academy and education partner Rao's IA Study Circle. The session this evening is titled Mothers and Daughters, Nandana Devsen in conversation with Urvashi Butalia. Can we hear a huge round of applause for our speakers, please? 
On this topic, we have award-winning actor, writer, and child rights activist Nandana Dev Sen. Nandana has also worked as a book editor, a screenwriter, and an ambassador and advocate. She has worked with children and grown-ups in UNICEF, Operation Smile, and Rahi to fight against child abuse. Nandana is the author of four children's books, which have been translated into 13 languages across the world. We welcome you, ma'am. In conversation with Nandana will be Urvashi Butalia, who is a publisher and writer. Co-founder of Kali for Women, India's first feminist publisher and now director of Zuban, she is also the author of the award-winning oral history of partition, The Other Side of Silence, Voices from the Partition of India. She also teaches the course Women, Society and Changing India at the Young India Fellowship, Ashoka University. We welcome you too, ma'am. Over to both the speakers for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That course gets a mention because these are my students doing the emceeing for the, <laughs> for the festival in many places. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good to see you here, Nandana. Great to be talking to you. So, you know, um, what we are going to do today is uh, Nandana and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, um, about mothers and daughters and about the writerly relationship between her and her mother um, who is, as many of you will probably know, uh, one of Bengal's best known and much loved writers, Navanita Dev Sen. Nandana herself, as you've just been told, is uh, many things, a woman of many parts. She is an actor. She is a writer of uh, different kinds of writing, including most recently children's books. She is a translator. Uh, she translates from Bengali into English. Uh, she is a child rights activist working with many different organizations as their ambassador and actually conducting workshops uh, on a range of issues to do with uh, children. And um, we are going to be talking about her and her mother, and indeed a little bit about her grandmother called Radha Rani, who too was a writer, was a child widow, who chose her own path in life, remarried, and then uh, wrote, uh, and was something of a rebel, which seems to have come down the three generations. So we'll be talking about the three generations. So Nandana, um, and please come in to my description of you whenever you want, but one of the things that your mother uh, says about you uh, when she tries to describe this very special relationship that the two of you have uh, as mother and daughter, as writer and writer, is your love of springing surprises and um, giving unusual gifts. And she talks about a time when uh, Nandana, who um, lived abroad and who would keep in touch with her mother on the phone a lot of the time, uh, and Navonita Di would, when speaking to Nandana on the phone, close her eyes and imagine that Nandana had pitched up in front of her. And one phone conversation, she was sitting in this way with her eyes closed, and when she opened them, who should be in front of her but Nandana, who had been fooling her all along and talking on the phone as if long distance. And you, you already, you turned up and called her and she had no idea that you were going to... She was in hospital then. Yes. Oh, she was in hospital then, okay. And then the other surprise that you sprung on her, which she also describes, is another time when she was in hospital. And when uh, various people had come and visited her during visiting hours, mm. uh, but... Uh, then, and it was her birthday, right? right. And what did you do? Uh, I showed up with a cake. Not a very original thing to do a, on a birthday, but yes, I was. Uh, she didn't know that I had come, uh, flown in from New York. And uh, yeah, I went there with, uh, with a cake and we celebrated. Yeah. But you didn't only go there with a the cake. You went there with a the cake at 10 o'clock at night after taking special permission. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. 
and gave her another surprise. So most recently, you gave your mother another uh, sort of rather literary and writerly surprise. Mm. Do you want to talk a little about that? What was that? What made you think of it? How did you do that? Yes. So, um, you know, my mom is uh, uh, prolific and, as uh, Urvashi said, extremely popular. She's a superstar and she has some you know, 90 books in print and all of that, but very few of them are available in English. And there's a big demand for her writing in English uh, within India and outside of India. So, and some of her prose has now been translated, but most of her poetry still hasn't been. So for her 75th birthday, um, I decided that I would do something a bit more original than a cake. And uh, I uh, translated this book um, of her poems. In Bangla, it's called Tumi Monosthir Koru. I don't know how many uh, people here speak Bangla. Okay, a few, <laughs> great. Um, and uh, so I, I, made, I made this translation, it's called Make Up Your Mind. And uh, that was my, we, we printed 75 copies and that was my birthday present to her on her 75th birthday. And then as it turns out, the book actually has been very well liked. So we've, it's, it's, it's now been, uh, ma I didn't really make it for, uh, as a book that would be published in that way. I hmm. sort of published it for her, but then now it's, it's, it's available for everybody. And it's, it, yeah, it, it was, it was, um, it was very fun, but it was, because I was doing it as a surprise, um, there were so many things I wanted to ask her when I was translating, uh, you know, because with poetry you can never be absolutely sure. There's so many ways of interpreting uh, an image, a word, a line, a, a metaphor, and, uh, but I couldn't do that. So I sort of had to think about what she was most likely to have meant or how she would have translated it if she were translating it herself. But I didn't always get it. I mean, she loved the translations and she often, but she's told me with a number of poems that I actually like your translation better, but I didn't in fact, that's not how, what okay. I was thinking when I was writing it. So. Do you want to give us a taste and yes. read a few poems? Yeah, I would love that. I'm going to write, uh, read one poem in Bangla just for uh, the, uh, those of us who, uh, don't know the language, also for the, those of us who do know the language, just to get a, give you a sense of the way it sounds. Uh, they're all very, very short poems. Jotokal kobitai. Beche thako, pute thako. Amok passport chobi hoye. Protek line tumi jege thako. Akonto teshtar moto. Chati phata jantro na amar. Pute thako. Lukiye theko na, jatokal kobitai baanchi. In poetry, stay alive, show yourself clearly, like the inevitable passport photo. Stay awake in every line, you, like an unquenchable thirst, yes, you. The pain that tears my heart apart, show yourself clearly, like a flower in full bloom. Don't hide from me, as long as I live in poetry. This one is the um, title poem, Make Up Your Mind. Should I do it in Bangla also or just yeah. in? Okay. In Bengali it's called Nirvachon. Tumi monosthir koro. কাকে চাও তাকে না আমাকে আমার মাঝখানে আছে দুজন মানুষ তুমি মনস্থির করো কাকে চাও তাকে না আমাকে মেক আপ ইউর মাইন্ড মেক আপ ইউর মাইন্ড হু ডু ইউ ওয়ান্ট দ্যাট ওমেন অমি উইদ ইন মি ব্রিদ টু পিপল মেক আপ ইউর মাইন্ড হু ডু ইউ হু ডু ইউ ওয়ান্ট দ্যাট ওমেন or me. I'm going to read um, this. Uh, a lot of her poetry is in, in rhyme, actually. So was my grandmother's. I mean, all of us uh, love rhymes. 
Uh, and my mother has a wonderful way of tackling quite difficult subjects in rhyme, which is not uh, a skill or not an interest, I should say, that, that many poets have. My grandmother did the same. So I want to read this poem. I'll only, the next couple of poems I'll only read in English. It's called The Night of the Rape. Man. In the twilight, I could still hear the lark, the woman, uh, woman. The night was moonless, oppressively dark. Man. In the flowering woods, a night fairy walked. Woman. In the sundarbans, the man-eater stalked. Man. In that fragrant springtime air, woman. Blood-drenched remains lay there. Thank you. This one is also, my mom is fascinated by the power as well, the power as, well as the uh, potential for destruction that language has. Um, this one is called, this one was also in rhyme. Um, this is called Growing Up Lesson. Boy, are you scared of bloodshed? Are you terrified of plucking virginity? If the taste of blood goes to your head, you fear it'll be a total calamity? The truth is, whether wrong or right, your blood calls out to you each night. Listen, boy, it's time for you to grow. Words can be as fierce, don't you know? The treachery that lingers on tongue tips, beyond the world that all your dreams show. Know that blood can be easily shed by lips. Um, I'm going to end with a poem that I think um, is kind of uh, all about the essence of Ma. Catch of the day. I want to chop it up. Slice it into pieces, grind it into a paste, season it, then shut it in the oven. They didn't win. The sun, the rain, the earth. It's still all raw inside, floundering like a catfish, still alive, freshly caught, my youth. Thank you. Thank you. Those are quite quite lovely and quite um, quite strong and powerful uh, just a technical question mm. because translating poetry is not easy um, how did you deal with the rhyme mm. um, well I decided that I would not I, that whenever there was a poem in rhyme I would keep the rhyme uh, which is not, you know, that's a decision, it's a very personal decision. A, a lot of poets, great poets, decide not to do that. Um, I also decided that I would keep the rhythm as, so the meter as similar uh, to the original as possible, um, which was not always easy to do, but um, it was actually really fun. And sometimes it meant that uh, I would have to extend a line a bit, uh, sometimes... I would, there was one poem, I, I won't read that out, but I actually extended it by a few lines because I thought what could be expressed with one word in Bangla couldn't appropriate, couldn't adequately be expressed in English. Um, and uh, as, you know, so, uh, but for me somehow that was very, uh, that was a, a priority when I was doing her poetry because as I said, I find it remarkable that she talks about the, uh, about very disturbing political um, unsettling issues through rhyme. Nandana, you translated these quite difficult poems on your honeymoon. <laughs> That's true, I did. And how did that work? How did you take time out? You have to use the mic. Don't yeah, <laughs> yeah I have, I, I'm, I'm very lucky to have an extremely tolerant husband who is here. And um, so, uh, John, this was, uh, we were in, in Spain, and uh, I had a deadline by which I had to send the, the poetry off, the translations off. So 
um, it was he was very he, he he was very understanding not only of the fact that I was spending a lot of time on this, but also of the fact that it I actually found the experience very uh, very moving uh, because I I had read all her poetry you know over my lifetime, but because of this project, I was reading, going through her poetry once again. Incidentally, I didn't only, I included uh, some of her older poetry in this book as well, so it's not quite exactly, it's not only the translation of her book called Tumi Monastir Koro, it has some of her earlier poems which I knew she loved. So I was going through all of them and I was looking at the dates that uh, when she wrote uh, those, po those poems and it felt like I was reading a journal um, and there were there was so much about her life that I felt I understood for the first time when I was reading those poems. I, I understood her estrangement with my father, uh, her loneliness. I understood the really intimate uh, but also uh, complicated relationship she had with my grandmother. Um, I understood how she used poetry as a coping mechanism to deal with her with pain, to deal with trauma, uh, and yet at the same time, how she felt uh, that her life could be as easily healed by poetry as it could be destroyed by it, um, and so this sort of potential for uh, creation as well as destruction uh, is something that comes back com comes into her poetry so many times. The fact she's written a lot about the multiple identities that women have, um, and how how they have to a woman has to balance it. And when I read all of the poetry together, it it to me it felt like I was reading the story of her life, and I felt very protective about her. I, I felt suddenly that I understood that that I wasn't there when this was. Uh, going on, I, I I didn't understand that this is what she was going through. So, so it was very. It's not easy to describe what I was feeling. I was feeling. I was very far away on my honeymoon in Spain. I was feeling extremely close to her. There was so much I wanted to tell her and talk to her about, and yet uh, it was difficult even to find the language for it. Um, and uh, you know, I was. And then I realized also afterwards when I did speak with her about it that. There were emotions that I was feeling on her behalf that she actually hadn't felt when she wrote those poems. Like there would be, there were poems I read about her uh, loneliness that made me feel very angry on her behalf. Mm. But she actually hadn't written those those poems out of anger. She hadn't, in fact, felt what I felt for her. Mm. Um, and there were poems that I there's a poem that I didn't read out, but I. It was interesting because I, th I interpreted that as her having to um, balance everything that she had to balance as a professor, as a poet, as a mother, as a daughter. Uh, can I just take a moment to read that? Mm. Okay. So, this is called The Acrobat. She thought she knew acrobatics rather well, that she could juggle time with both hands, play with the now right next to the then. She would make both dance, she thought, fist to fist. And she would glide so smooth along the tight rope. She thought she could do absolutely anything at all. Only once in your life will the rope shiver. So, I, when I read this, I thought this is about mm her and the chances that she has had to take. Um, uh, but yet when I spoke to her about it, she said, I understood that in fact for her, this, this poem was all about poetry. It's all about choosing the right word and the balance. Mm. It was about linguistic balance. It was, I had read a whole kind of feminist narrative into it, which is mm. actually not how she had written it. Mm. So anyway, it was a very, um, it was a really beautiful, intense, experience uh, and uh, you know it it brought us I felt closer to her even though I was really far away mm. but in some ways um, 
the barriers of intimate relationships in terms of uh, making yourself vulnerable, putting your thoughts out there, and especially between mothers and daughters, mm. are often quite difficult to transcend. Mm. Um, when your mother and you talked about what you felt on reading her, her poems and what you put into the translating of them and what she might have uh, meant to write when she was writing and the differences and uh, things like that. Were, they, were those conversations difficult? Were they easy? Were it, was it a mix of both? Did she feel that, you know, in a sense, poetry is often so personal and so intimate to the writer. Mm. But if it's read in anonymity without knowledge of that person's personal life, right. uh, you can receive it differently. Mm -hmm. If it's read in knowledge, as mm -hmm. you did, you receive it differently. Mm -hmm. But what does that person have to say about it? You've said a little bit about what your mother felt, but I'm just wondering how those conversations went. About the translation. Mm. I think, um, sorry, uh, it, it was, it, it was not, I, th I think I kind of created the difficulties myself in a way, because as you said, when you, uh, when you translate uh, a favorite poet's poetry uh, as a translator uh, without having knowledge of their personal life or you know, not, not intimate knowledge, mm. uh, it's a very different experience. Mm. Um, and then in my case, because of course, it, it, I, I, I don't know that uh, how well I was able to negotiate between the identities of being a daughter and being a translator. Um, in terms of the, not in terms of the translation, but in terms of my emotional response mm. to the material, uh, she was really delighted. And as I said, there were uh, poems that she, she told me that the way, what my interpretation of it was not what she had meant, but she uh, was 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 hap was very happy that there was another uh, kind of way poetry. into the same okay. same poetry. But um, I mean, there's so much that we ca it, it's never um, it is uh, it, it it is a, a complicated process uh, when you're. Working, you know, we, I'll tell you a little bit, uh, maybe we'll come back to it later, but we sort of did the process in reverse mm. too, where I, one of my children's books called Not Yet, um, is, it came out in a number of languages, it, it's by, in, in eight bilingual editions. So the Bangla edition, my mother and I translated together. So we went through the process of her actually uh, working on it when she was in Calcutta and me working on it when, we, when I was in New York and then spending endless hours uh, on FaceTime, kind of bringing the two together. And uh, it was very sweet and it's very fun, but when you have two uh, opinionated, argumentative, creative uh, women um, who also have a close and not uncontentious relationship, of course it's complicated. Mm. So that actually leads me to my next question, which was going to be precisely um, about this. So you come from a long tradition of writing, your mother, your grandmother, all three of you have been writers, are writers, different kinds of writers as well. Uh, your mother shared some of her thoughts with her mother, mm -hmm. just as you do with your mother. Mm. Um, you know, oftentimes mothers, uh, mothers like our mothers, mm. uh, creative women, strong women, um, opinionated women, also have very strong dreams for their daughters. Mm. And very often those are their own dreams which are projected onto the daughters or the, the potential that they see in their daughters. Um, so you and your mother being in the same field, mm. um, being writers, mm those relationships can often also be contentious. As, mm. as you grow older, you write more, um, and as your mother grows older, you know, I don't mean your mother, but just well, as mothers grow older, grow and, older yeah, and time, and you know, in a sense, they sense time running out, maybe they've not been able to fulfill a dream which the daughter is fulfilling, but that's not exactly what they wanted, and yet it is what they wanted. It can be quite contentious. How do you and Nobunita D deal with this because on the face of it when you read 
your writings about each other. Mm. They are so filled with love and warmth and affection and generosity and sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so one question I have is, it, it, they seem to flow effortlessly and I can't think that that's so easy, mm. that writing like that. So that's a writer um, a question. Mm -hmm. But secondly, about the relationship that informs that writing. Mm. Is it always uncontentious? Is it always so wonderful? Of course, it's not always uncontentious, and I, I want to say my, you know, it's my sister is also a writer, and mm -hmm. she's been writing for a very long time, and you know, we, I kind of grew up in this all family, uh, all female family of writers, and all four of us, including my grandmother, uh, my, you know, my grandmother, my mother, my didi, and me, we all started writing as children. Mm. Uh, poetry, also strangely, that was somehow our chosen medium as, as young, as young people, and. We have also always had this kind of tradition in the, within the family of writing poetry for each other. Instead of birthday mm. uh, cards, we would write poems. We also have, and we still do, uh, we, r we frequently share each other's writing with each other. Uh, we edit each other's work. My grandmother, and my mother used to, my grandmother used to live on the uh, on Tintola, you know, second floor, and my, my mom used to be on the uh, uh, Dotola, or first floor. Mm -hmm. And they would constantly send notes up and, you know, mm -hmm. between the floors with, uh, my grandmother had beautiful handwriting and, you know, the her sort of meticulous edits. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of do the same as a, in terms of having a writer, what, our writerly relationship within the family is like um, it's a very it's very close and it, it is contentious in that uh, we don't always I may not agree with an edit my mother is wanting to make on my work and mm. similarly she may not she frequently doesn't but what is great uh, about our relationship uh, is that is not that we don't disagree because we frequently do but that we've managed to negotiate a way of working together, um, despite the contentiousness, despite our natural argumentativeness. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, th I think we don't get unsettled by conflict. Hmm. And you are working on something together, the two of you, mm. right? Yes. Do you want to yes. tell us a little? Yes, um, we are working I I on uh, an intergenerational book. It's um, it's. Um, tentatively titled Mother Tongues. Um, and how it came about is, is kind of an interesting story. I had written a couple of pieces about the women in my life, um, narrative nonfiction pieces, uh, at, which had been published. And quite separately, um, Chiki Sarkar, who was at Penguin at that time, and Shobha, Shobha De suggested that I, I write a book, take that theme, Bring it close. sorry, take that theme of generations of rule-breaking women making mm. choices that are seen as scandalous, mm. uh, and using that to write a book about the three generations within our family. Now, my mother had for a very long time been fascinated by this. Uh, she wrote a lot about it, including the piece that you've read mm. uh, called The Wind Beneath My Wings. And um, so, she had always also wanted to, felt very strongly that this project needed to be done. Although the, that, I mean, her vision of it was somewhat different. But what we decided this year is that we should bring that together and we should write a book together about uh, the three generations within our family. And, you know, from, a, from the point of view of the growth of a woman-centered literary and political tradition. Mm. Um, and that's what we are, that's what we are working on right now. So we are um, having, we're writing it in three different voices, uh, voices of my grandmother who, as you said, was um, a, a wonderful uh, poet herself, wid a child widow, um, and broke a lot of rules in her time. Mm -hmm. Not, she was a natural feminist, so to, you know, it wasn't, uh, but there were lots of choices that she made as a as a poet as well as a uh, as a 
young woman as a wife, as a mother, that were very strongly feminist choices. Um, so we're going to have her voice, uh, my mother's voice, and my voice, my story is the least interesting, so uh, we'll have to see how that works out. And we are going to weave in a narrative which uh, shows how this tradition of um, writing and speaking out mm. developed within our family. And in doing this, you're going to negotiate um, physical geographical distance because you are placed elsewhere, your mother is in Kolkata, mm -hmm. and uh, although your lives are quite kind of um, intermeshed, right. um, but um, I think you need to give that to me. Oh. <laughs> That's to say how many minutes left. We have, we have 30 minutes we have 30 left. 30 minutes left. That's a lot. That's <laughs> a lot. But we'll open it <laughs> up you. also. Um, for uh, questions and things that people want to ask at some point. Um, so what I was saying was that you're going to negotiate um, distance in some way in this mm -hmm. and write in your different ways. But um, to move a little bit beyond the, the relationship that you and your mother have as writers, mm -hmm. uh, in your own life, even though you say my life is not really uh, that interesting, but that's I think your modesty, in your own life you have made a lot of choices uh, in what you want to do and um, you've kind of given up um, academics and moved into films and then moved from there to being a writer and reinvented yourself a lot of times. Mm. Your parents have both been quite supportive in this um, and but what have they thought of your choices actually mm. apart from being supportive what has your mother thought of your choices? Um. I'm Mike, glad Mike. you asked me that because it just reminded me of the, the fact that one of the, you asked so many interesting questions and I actually didn't answer one of your earlier questions which was about how as mothers uh, we want our daughters to fulfill our dreams. Yeah. Your book has such a lovely um, part about mothers and daughters mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, very, very touching. Um, but I... I think with both of my parents be being uh, free thinkers and uh, staunch uh, proponents of a democratic way, they have never been, um, they've always been very supportive of every crazy choice that I've made. Mm -hmm. Surprise, frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in college, they expected me to be an academic because I was a, you know, I was a rather good student and that seemed to be the way I was going. Then when I went into publishing and I became an editor, they were happy about that. That was still sort of in the world of yeah, literature and books. Then I decided to go to film school, which uh, they were surprised by, but again supportive of. Mm. Uh, then I became quite busy as an actor. And they have always been extremely, I mean, they've come, both of them, although, you know, as you know, they live in different continents. They've flown to my film premieres, whether it's been at Cannes Film Festival or in Toronto or in the London Film Festival. They've come to my theater premieres, whether at Prithvi or at the York Theater in New York, etc. Um, and I think there was a part of them that was kind of thrilled by the fact that I was doing something that was so different hmm. from what they, what they have done and also from what they expected me hmm. to do. Uh, but I think now that I am more full-time as a writer, I can also see their relief. So I understand, for instance, my mother um, never made me feel that I had, uh, that she was worried about the choices I was making as an actress. In fact, I have to say that uh, she was always extremely, uh, not, just, not just supportive, but fearless on my behalf. You know, one of the films I did called Rang Rasia was a very controversial film. It is a true story about the first Indian court case about mm -hmm. censorship of art. It is the first Hindi, it had a lots of firsts. It's the first Hindi language film in which there is uh, an Indian actress uh, embraces nudity. nudity yeah. uh, and the first such film that the censor board passed without a cut. Mm -hmm. Of course, eventually there were moves to ban it and we had mm -hmm. to fight that battle and it ended up being a much smaller release mm. than what it was supposed to have, mm. but, that it, but that didn't come from the censor board. Mm. Uh, but there was a lot of hate mail and trolling that I got, got mm. because of that. Mm. Um, it was very interesting because the, the story, the true story that we see in the film of the muse being ostracized, persecuted by 
the price that she pays for uh, uh, the price that she pays for art. Uh, I mean, I don't want to make a grand statement about it, but it was a similar kind of criticism, as in, how can a woman, an actress who has appeared in the nude, have her face be represented as Lakshmi? Right, that kind of uh, that kind of criticism, and I thought my mother would be very uh, upset about it on my behalf, but she just sort of laughed it away, mm. which was brilliant. So uh, that's just one example, but there are many others. She she kind of always enjoyed the fact that as an actor, I've always been drawn to films that have some kind of strong social or political content. Most of these films, they're all eccentric films made, you know, yeah. in remote parts of the world. And somebody told me uh, that asked me why I always make films that are either impossible to make or impossible to sell. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. And I have to say that uh, she didn't uh, get phased by the fact that I was making these difficult choices even as an actor. Mm. Uh, Nandana, let's move to another of your interests. So you have, as we said earlier, been a child rights activist. Mm. And you worked with UNICEF and you worked with Rahi and you worked with Apne Aap. In fact, you said you just conducted a workshop for some 400 Mm -hmm. Children? Mm -hmm. in where uh, on it? Children's Day, it's just on the 14th of November in Kolkata. In Kolkata. And what did you do? Tell us a little. We did, uh, we did two things which were really fun, actually. There was, there was a big, it was a large mix of uh, ages. Mm. So there were some very, very young kids, and then there were some uh, sort of uh, adolescents and, and teenagers. So we read um, this book which is, uh, there's a Bengali version of it called Ekunina. Uh, it is a mother-daughter story. It's about a little girl who doesn't want to go to sleep and the mom who has to play with her and convince her to go to sleep. It was inspired by my niece, speaking about generations. My niece was supposed to be here today. I don't know if she's here. Are you there? Yes. Yeah, she's she is there. a writer as well. She writes songs. She is eight. Her name is Hia. And uh, this was inspired by her and her mom, my sister, my Didi, who still spends hours and hours. Is she there? Yes, there Who's she is. Who's called Antara. Who, um, yes, and my sister Antara Devsen mm -hmm. and my uh, niece Hia Muktika. Um, so it was inspired by the relationship they have and the time that she needs to spend every day to put her to sleep. But anyway, this, it's a very fun book. It has a refrain which is, it's about a child who keeps saying ekunina. And so we read that out with all the children yelling out ekunina. Uh, mm -hmm. And they didn't want it to end, actually. So once it finished, they kept saying ekunina, ekunina, ekunina. <laughs> so that's one part of it. And the other thing that we did, which was very, very moving, was to actually read some of Nehru's poems mm -hmm. uh, to Indira Gandhi. And mm -hmm. Ruchira and I read, mm -hmm. took turns reading them out. Uh, I read them in Bengali, and she read them in Hindi. Um, and it was wonderful to go back to, I mean, he talks about such uh, essentially important concepts in such a beautiful, simple, child-friendly way, whether it's about equality, whether it's about um, democracy, mm -hmm. whether it's about peace. Uh, he talks about the caste system. He talks about religion. He talks about uh, economic injustice and it was great to be able to speak about those uh, to young people in a language that uh, was comprehensible at a time when I think it's really important to make young people think about all of these mm. uh, and questions of justice and equality especially. Um, but do, um, is it, is Ekunina not yet the um, it's not the only children's book in which the mother-daughter relationship enters your work. It's a, a, a lot of your work is informed by that, again, in a different way. Yes, that's true. Uh, so I've written four children's books, um, and uh, uh, three of them are about the mother-daughter relationship. Mambi and the Forest Fire is not a, about a mother-daughter relationship. In fact, I keep being asked by kids where Mambi's parents are, huh. but that that book actually came out of a, a workshop that I did in, with a group of kids who had been rescued from trafficking in, 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 uh, uh, in, a, in a home called Sneha in northern Indrapur near Kolkata. Anyway, except for that, all the others have the mother-daughter theme. And part of it is, I think, because 
I am drawn to it, mm. clearly. It's, uh, we always write about what moves us the most. Mm. And I think in our family, the relationship that has existed between my grandmother and my mother, and my mother and my sister and, and me, and, you know, and all of us together, has been a very strong and formative influence. And I, so I think it keeps coming back. And, and make up your mind, even though it's about it's my mother's poetry, the whole experience of translating it also makes it a mother-daughter book. Mm. Um, but uh, I also feel very strongly that, uh, and you know this because you're an, uh, a wonderful children's book publisher as well as all the other, uh, as, as well as everything else that you do so beautifully and powerfully, um, there we still have a huge lack of books with female protagonists. Mm. Um, and while little girls quite happily read books which have male heroes, little boys don't usually like to read books yeah. which have female heroes. So, so Mambi, which she doesn't have a mom or a dad, but she is very much a she. And she is, in fact, someone who is as loved by boys as she is by girls. But that was, not, uh, that was a very conscious choice that I made. All my books have female protagonists because I think it's really important for us to break that gender coding that, that happens so early. Mm. But I also find that lots of, in popular culture, not just books, but also films, really talk so much about uh, boys looking for their father. You know, whether it's uh, Finding Nemo, or whether it's, uh, it's Star Wars, whether it's uh, Neil Gaiman wrote a very, very interesting book, actually, and he's such a great writer, but he also wrote about, about a boy and a, and a dad. And this is sort of much more of a recurring theme in popular culture for children than the mother-daughter theme. And I feel it's so important to uh, represent that and also re to represent that in a way that's not conventional. So apart from, uh, there's, I think I have another, maybe I don't have it here, but um, yeah, this one, I just did a session on this in, uh, in Bukaru. It's called Talkie Tumble of Jumble Farm. This book is actually dedicated to my dad because he was the inspiration behind it. Not yet is dedicated to my niece and my mom. But uh, this one is about, uh, it's all about anagrams and antonyms. So it's very much about word puzzles, but it also has two stories. And it's about the relationship that a little girl has with her working mom, working single mom. Mm. And it's about how they take care of each other. So it's not just about the mom taking care yeah. of the girl, it's yeah. about the girl taking care of the mom. Yeah. And it's important to make, make daughters understand that they have a lot of uh, power to actually help and in a way transform the lives of their parents and their mothers. So, yeah. Yeah, and in the end, sometimes often, I mean, this is often said, you become your mother. You you you're destined to become my, uh, your <laughs> yeah, mother. mother. I, I find that I'm yeah. not, I mean, I wish I could become her in all the wonderful uh, wonderful ways that she has evolved, but certainly I, I find that the little things that that sometimes annoy me about my the little things that sometimes annoy me about my mother as I get older, I find that I, I have started to do every single one of them yourself, as my husband points out. So <laughs> yes, okay. So um, I think we're now running out of time. I want to ask you to do one other thing, mm. but just a little comment. Uh, you know, just in the same way as their writing link. Uh, Nobonita Di and Nondona as mother and daughter, daughter and mother. There is another thing that links them that Nondona has especially done today, which is the bindi. <laughs> so she's chosen uh, to wear the bindi. That's Do you true. want to end with reading a little tribute to oh. your mother? And then if we have a little time, we'll open it up to questions. I'd love that. This, so this is a short five minute uh, excerpt, the introduction to the book. This was the introduction to the book that was her birthday surprise. It's called Daughtering Beauty. My first semester in college, she arrived in between her conferences, suitcases and admirers in tow. Refusing abundant offers of hospitality in Cambridge, she shared and immediately redecorated the one and a half rooms assigned to my two roommates and me. Every morning, she stood in line in our noisy dormitory to claim her three minutes in the shower. She preferred the modern steel and glass shower stalls opposite our room 
to the quieter, more old-fashioned bath down the hall. She left after a week, just as I was getting used to finding her hip-length hair in my comb and turning every head in the 1,000-strong freshman union when she swept into dinner with me, gliding in like a queen, like she always does. A few weeks later, we hit midterm exams. I overslept the first day, found the showers occupied, and sprinted to the other bathroom in panic. As I stumbled onto freezing tiles and fiddled with the cranky knob that spurted cold water for red and boiling for blue, something miraculously familiar caught my eye. A crimson dot of velvet on the narrow gray wall. Her well-traveled bindi carefully transported from her forehead and placed beyond reach of the spray. In a flash, I could hear her laugh and smell her scent. I could feel the tension in my neck melt into the mist surrounding me. That perfect circle of red gave evidence on that mildewed wall of her always being there, far away, yet so close. L, eternity, poem, j'adore, trésor, happy, forever and ever. Why do her favorite perfumes always seem to talk about her? And yet, no matter which one she wears, she always smells wondrously the same. It's that essence of ma, that adjective defying all too familiar fragrance that lingers in her sari before it's washed, that seeps out of her suitcase as soon as she opens it, that greeted us every evening along with her whistled code as my sister and I raced each other down the stairs to let her in after work. She would be awake for hours each night after we went to sleep, correcting tutorials, completing conference papers, finishing a poem, completing a painting. I never knew when she came to bed, but even in my dreams, I'd get a whiff of that ma smell when she vigorously rubbed Nivea on our sleep-heavy faces. Last year, I pulled out a big blue book from our Kolkata shelf, 365 Bedtime Stories. When I opened it, out fell a red-gold rush of leaves, oaks, maples, and ferns that my sister and I had collected in London when I was a toddler. We had gathered them together in the woods at the bottom of the hill where we lived. One night, as she was reading to me about Tinkerbell, I had interrupted Ma with a technical question. What are, what are fairy wings made of? Butterfly wings, bird feathers, or huge petals? Well, there are all kinds of fairies, you see, Ma replied, just like there are all kinds of people. Do all fairies look like you? I persisted. I don't think so, she smiled. Fairies are very, very beautiful. But Ma, I protested, you're the most beautiful person in the world. She laughed, much more loudly than Tinkerbell would have, as she drew heavy curtains over our windows. Every little girl believes that about their mother, Tumpush. Well, Ma, I've grown up a bit. My world has grown up a lot. I left home as a child and made beautiful friends who became my family. In my work, I've met many beautiful faces, walked with beautiful figures. I've fallen in love with beautiful minds. You've grown up too. More books published, many awards won. More world tours, some with me when we disagreed on everything. A few more panic attacks about your stubborn daughters around your eyes. A few more lines celebrating years of full-throated joy. And we fought. I've cried when you haven't understood. I've begged you not to nag. I've yelled at you when I was upset with another. I've watched with panic as tears welled up in your ever-adolescent eyes. But I'm as sure today as I was that night in London that even if you had not been my mother, even if that most precious accident of birth had by rights been the beginning of someone else's story, even if I'd met you in any of your other roles as a poet, professor, painter, friend, or a stranger on a tram, 
you would still be the most beautiful person I could ever have met. Thank you, Nandana. Do we, we have five minutes? Does anyone have a question or a comment? We can't see you in the dark, really. I know. Is there but, a way of, um, but you could shout, and then we'll look towards the, the sound. And we have mics, right? Yeah, we do have mics. Yeah, there's one here I can see in the second row. I think you've gone. Oh, OK. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you अभी तक आप कितनी किताब लिखी हुई हूँ? पांच. एक तो मेरी चार बच्चों के लिए. चार बच्चों के लिए और एक जो मैं मेरे मामी की poetry की translation अनुबाद की चुकी हूँ. So so five पांच. Okay. Okay. Next question. Could you please uh, hold the mic closer to your mouth, please? Yes, okay. of course. Uh, uh, I'm familiar with Navanita's uh, Bengali stories. Yes. And uh, uh, I, it may be my own reaction. I always liked them a lot because I thought that there was a kind of self irony, a kind of humor yes. in her stories. Even when she was writing about uh, a painful domestic situation, maybe. Yes. Huh? yes. Uh, it seemed to me, when, as I listened to your poems, that that kind of quality is um, absent uh, from her poems. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it, uh, that's what I felt. Uh, mm -hmm. And whether she reserved a kind of a serious, I mean, uh, another kind of tone or feelings or language for her poetry uh, than what when she wrote. I think that's story. an excellent question. And you're right. I think her, even though she talks about a lot of the same uh, she, she touches on the same themes and concerns in her poetry as she does in her prose. I think her personality in prose is, is different. Uh, it is, it, I mean, what, what, what she does in prose in terms of uh, adding a light touch to quite serious topics, she does in poetry through rhyme. But the voice that emerges in poetry is different from the voice that emerges in prose. I think that's an excellent question. Uh, you describe yourself as a publishing consultant as well. So yes. do you help uh, aspiring youngsters to publish their works? Could I do a help aspiring writers? Would I? Uh, can I? What? Uh, uh, would I? Would I help aspiring writers? Youngsters, youngsters to publish. Youngsters, their yes. To publish their works. To publish their books. To publish their books. I I would love to. I don't have a lot of. Uh, uh, ability to do so right now because I'm not in publishing anymore. I was in publishing an, a long time ago. I was an editor at Houghton Mifflin Company, and now that company doesn't even exist. But um, of course, I would I would be really delighted to give any advice that I can from the little experience that I have as a writer. My career as a writer is very young. I haven't been writing for very long, and uh, the experience that I have I had in the past as an as an editor. Um, you mentioned young people. I, I write a column um, that is meant absolutely for young people in The Wire, which uh, deals with young adult issues. Uh, but rather than doing it in an editorial format, uh, I do it in a narrative format. And um, I, uh, the reason why that happened is because I think very often uh, the, the point that you made is how do you reach out to young people and would I be open to reaching out to young people? It is something that is actually very important to me. So if you can think of ways in which I can help young people who want to publish, I'd be delighted to do that. Uh, we have time for one last question. As a Bengali reader, we are familiar with Navanita's versatile writing. Did you ever uh, think to translate his track Bahone Makmahone or Shit Shaho Sheikh Hemantolo in translation? Actually, Both it's a unique one. I, Shaho Sheikh by I, I can't agree with you more, and I have good news for you. Both of those books have been recently translated. So uh, they, they, they are, you can, they are available um, in, in English both of those books. I'm sorry, are you, uh, is, were you, 
Because she's a so versatile writer, no one should know. Yes. Uh, vast public, they didn't know about her writing, no? especially we Bengali reader, we know about her. I absolutely agree, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to translate uh, Tumi Monus Tirkoro. That's one of the um, one of the forces uh, uh, behind Make Up Your Mind, and uh, I'm glad that uh, there is more of her writing available now. But it's still not enough. I mean, she's written her body of work, as we all know, is huge, and. Uh, I agree that more of her books need to be translated and made available to a wider audience. It's a great note on which to end. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Nandana. That thank you. Thank you so you. much for doing this. And good luck. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving yet another huge round of applause for both our speakers. Uh, the uh, translation of her mother's poems uh, that Nandana has done, Make Up Your Mind, is available for sale uh, at the bookshop here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the children's books. And if you want to get them and get Nandana to sign them, then that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, speakers. Our 